I will be using this with antimatter photon lasers because what I have is creation at the end of my thoughts. The number of people with bipolar disorder has risen threefold in the last two decades. It's just like this glorious technical world that you're in, you know? It's absolutely amazing. 3% of us, that's nearly 2 million people in Britain today, are thought to have this serious mental illness. I was completely off the chart, um, as delusional as you can get. Who are these people? What did they experience? What do they feel? My name's Philippa Perry. I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm intrigued by these questions. I wonder whether there was any trauma or anything. No, zero. 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 Why are so many of us now diagnosed with bipolar? Genetics, brain chemistry, and life experience are all thought to play a part in the disorder but the exact causes of bipolar are unknown. How can we pull apart environmental factors and genetic factors? I think that's the real challenge. I want to get inside the minds of those living with extremes of manic highs. Marble waterfall, 100 feet tall there, coming all the way down, going down in those directions. <sighs> and suicidal lows. I need some midnight <laughs> You just want to die. Yeah. Just want to face the wall and die. What clues can be found in the lives of those living with the disorder? Mwah. Love you, Mama. <laughs> and can a single and relatively recent label really explain the range of symptoms experienced by two million people? You feel like your life's in danger, don't you? You you've told me that. Morning. Good morning. Bipolar is currently viewed as a medical condition best managed with drugs. But as a psychotherapist, I tend to come at things from a different angle. The cause of most mental breakdown, I believe, come from the environment. It's a learnt set of, of reactions and responses. I want to explore people's life histories to see what clues they can provide as to why people experience these dramatic highs and lows. I think too often we, we ask what's wrong with someone rather than asking what happened to them and what kind of mental scars that may have left them with. Three people with the bipolar diagnosis have bravely agreed to open their lives to me so that we can try to piece together the story behind their extreme symptoms. <laughs> 54-year-old entrepreneur Paul was diagnosed with bipolar type 1 just 10 years ago. I've come to meet Paul in a large hotel, golf club, spa type place just outside Stratford-upon-Avon. And I'm quite curious as to why I've got to meet him here. Um, but here I am. People with bipolar 1, formerly known as manic depression, experience deep depressions and extreme highs called manias that often involve completely losing touch with reality. I need to understand how it affects Paul. And so, after consultation with his psychiatrist and social worker, I'm meeting him while he's in a mania. Are you Paul? I am. Hi. <laughs> I've been looking for you. Why, why did you want to meet here? It's a beautiful spot. Well, when I came here, I said, the one place that I'm going to own as my home is what I've always called Time Castle. And naturally, the day I take over, we're going to put Time Castle where it's supposed to be, at the centre of everything that happens on planet Earth. While manic, Paul spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on fanciful schemes. He's also been taken into mental institutions for his own care. Suite number 133 is on the end. Yeah. Uh, that's, that, that shall be my suite. Yeah. In the counter suite, most magnificent suite here, will be Moses and the re and resurrection of Moses and his family, and the Esau resurrection of Jesus Christ and his family, 
in the back end, Solomon in the middle. Paul's delusions might appear random, but I'm already noticing they all seem to point in the same direction. In this state, he's seeing himself as special, divine even. And that's where I'll have the Pope stay when he's here, Vladimir Putin and Wen Jiabao in those others. So, who's told you you've got bipolar, Paul? Uh, every psychiatrist that I've met, um, I've been labelled as being something that I'm nowhere near. My so-called bipolar disorder doesn't exist. I'm infinipolar, I see the whole of the moon, but the moment I step out of the box, <laughs> mental institution or jail cell. What's feeding Paul's delusions? I wonder what happened, uh, whether there was any trauma or anything. No. Not at all. No trauma before you had your first Zero. episode? Zero. 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 Did Paul's bipolar really just appear one day? Can I have a bit more history about your life? Yes. Have you ever had any drugs? Um, I've tried every... I've tried most things in my time. Yes, of course. Oh, well, I, when they say I have bipolar disorder, I simplify it, saying, no, I don't have bipolar disorder, I have a split personality. I'm Paul and I'm Yar. There's nothing in between. It's not bipolar disorder. I'm Paul or I'm Yar. Yar sounds like a god, just the name to me. Yes. He's the greatest mind there's ever been, and mine is. And we'll expose it piece by piece, whatever box by box. I've just met Paul. And and wow. he seems to have a different reality to most other people. Nobody can understand what he's talking about. So it is a very lonely place to be. And I'm going to make this into the most amazing golf course in the world. Yeah. Having holes 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 6, 7, 7, 7. Every digit there is covered. He has got that mania thing when you connect every single thing, and he's taking it to the extreme. The 18th hole is going to be 777 yards long, par 7. There isn't a par 7. I wonder how we look after people like that, because they don't see themselves as needing looking after. I mean, he feels completely like he's in charge of the entire universe. And remember, the mar marble waterfall, 100 feet tall there, coming all the way down, going down in those directions. And I can have it all installed in 60 days. From the day, of course, I take over the world, which effectively, July the 18th. I've met one person living with bipolar type 1. But what about type 2? It's 3 a.m. in South Wales, and 43-year-old Sean is baking carrot cake. I get really... It feels like my skin is crawling. Sean has intense highs called hypomanias. She's suffered extreme mood swings all her adult life, but has only recently been diagnosed with bipolar type 2. It's got better since I changed medication, but it never goes away. So I have um, a constant internal dialogue. So I actually hear my thoughts in my head. People with bipolar type 2 experience highs and lows, but delusional symptoms are rare. Steve started to notice that I was um, behaving different to usual. Gardening in the middle of the night and pouring rain. A few weeks later, and Sean has come down from her hypomania. During the last year, she's also been through long bouts of depression and has attempted suicide three times. Hi, Hello. I'm Philippa. I'm Sean. How Come do you in. do? Hello. I want to know how Sean experiences her symptoms. You've hurt your ankle. Yes. I snapped it, I have. A snap? Yeah. Actually, when I did it, I was really manic. Were you? Yeah. And I was absolutely delighted. Euphoric. Because, because I broke my ankle. I never broke my ankle before. Ha! 
Like taking photos, posting it on Facebook. Look at my leg. Sean's hypomanias sound like they involve obsessive behaviour. Everything tastes better, smells better. Everything is far sort of... All the colours are more vivid. Yeah. And that it's, it's just like this glorious technical world that you're in, you know? It's absolutely amazing. It sounds great. It is. It's a lot of fun until I crash. For me, obsessive behaviour is often a clue to trouble feelings that the obsession is blocking out. My depression episodes, do you just want to die? Yeah. Just want to face the wall and die. It's, it's just... Uh, it's horrible. I, I get waves, you know, and mm. I just think I can remember Steve sitting there with the tears rolling down his face. Goodness, you've had a really rough mm. last 12 months, haven't yeah. you? We've been talking about your bipolar, mm -hmm. and I wonder if there was anything in the environment, you know, was there trauma in your childhood or...? or... Yeah, I'm really sorry, no. Nothing? <laughs> no. Nothing at all. I mean, I've been racking my brains for a good 20-odd years, mm. maybe more, 30 years, and I just think I had all the crap genes, the wild ones, you know? Unlike Paul, Sean isn't delusional, but I've noticed that they both see their extreme impulses as being beyond their control. That's something I want to explore further. Right now, though, I want to meet Sean's partner, Steve, and sons, Jesse and Taryn. Best way to describe it is a roller coaster. Mm. Um, it's worrying. Mm. Um, worrying because, especially when I was going to work, you don't know what you're coming home to. So whether that's whether she's depressed or when she's hyper, Sean's mood will dictate to the how the mood is in the house. Yeah. It's as if there's two different people in there, like. Yeah. It's like there's a switch. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's sort of like demoralising, I guess, because if she's again responsive, it sort of brings your mood down a bit as well. It rubs off on you, so. Sort of. Yeah. When you see things a bit more clearly, then, I mean, the guilt comes and, you know, to the point where I worry um, if it is genetic, which one of my boys is going to have bipolar, which one of my boys is going to have to go through this. Mm. In Buckinghamshire, 36-year-old Ashley also has a bipolar type 2 diagnosis. He was given this nine years ago. But there's a key difference with his symptoms. His mood can swing from elation to crippling lows several times a day. In these depressed spells, he's unable to move or even form words. I, hmm? I, I, I don't want I need to I don't want to. Hi, Ashley. Hello, I'm Philippa. Hi, how Pleased are you? Pleased to meet you. Yeah, not too bad at all. This is my uh, grotto. It looks like you're very busy here. You've I am indeed, yeah, I am indeed. I uh, play a lot of music. Actually, you know, this has made me feel really high doing all this. It's really just showing you your reaction to it. Now, that brings me to another point, because if your reaction was, you know, some negative yeah. thing, then I could go into a negative spiral, and this really is, does sum up the, my condition. Ashley's told me he's been taking antipsychotic drugs since he was eight. He's currently on a range of medication. I want to know more. 
I've got Daisy Pam, and I need to calm myself down a bit. But How long have you had those? Uh, quite a long time now. And also I take Prozac as well yeah. for my depression. How long have you been on uh, that one? A long time as well. What, years and years and years? Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, it's sending me down again. You can yeah. tell, can't you? Mm, yeah. Mm. I'm taken aback by the sudden change in Ashley's mood. It wasn't great for you to talk about the med medication, was no. it? Do you want to talk to me about what's going on? Yeah, I would, actually, yeah. That's it. What, what, what are you experiencing right now, Ashley? I just don't know what it is, whether it's a voice or whether it's a thought or... I don't know what it is. But when I'm... Yeah, quiet. When I'm quiet, it, you know, it's like a... It keeps going. It keeps going. <laughs> yeah, narrative. You're quiet, but there's a voice dialogue, that keeps going, yeah. yeah. Dialogue. You know what's going through my mind? Sorry. It's just been difficult. Ashley's rapid cycle of emotions would be hard for anyone to deal with, but it strikes me how talking, even a little, seemed to help him. For the most part, though, he's dealing with his symptoms alone. He seems to be on a tightrope of sort of ecstasy and agony, really. It's such a narrow rope he seems to have to walk on. I don't know quite what's going on, and I've got more questions than answers, really. I've now met three people with very different symptoms and life experiences, and it's only deepening my curiosity about bipolar. Can their very different problems really all have the same underlying cause? Sean feels that her highs and lows are down to a biological flaw she was born with. Would you like to see my little bag of Dolly mixtures? Yes, please. The treatment Sean's pursuing is also biological. Like nearly 80% of people with a bipolar diagnosis, Sean's been placed on medication. Right, that's an antidepressant. These are the antipsychotics, which I take in the evenings. Have you found any of these drugs useful? <sighs> um, yeah, yeah. I know the combination isn't right yet, but they are managing to sort of quell the two extremes. Yeah. Can you imagine what you would have been like if you'd never been put on any psychiatric drugs? What would that be like? I'd be dead. No two ways about it. Definitely. You've saved your life. Yeah. Yeah. As a psychotherapist, I don't prescribe psychiatric drugs, and I'm not an expert on how they might work. Sean's experience makes me want to find out more. Any of the bad thoughts or any of the things which is... Um, Today, Sean's having a quarterly medical review with her consultant psychiatrist, Dr Muthu Kumar. I think it's about twice I've kind of yeah, been but, very low and yeah. contemplated to taking enough medication never to wake up. I'm hoping he can explain the thinking behind Sean's regime of medication. What do you think causes it um, and what do you think has caused it in Sean's case? Mainly the biological reasons, like brain chemical changes in, in, in the brain is one of the main reasons. Sometimes like what we see is the, the depression comes out of the blue for no apparent reason. Yes. So if it is kind of an identifiable reason, then you can say, like, okay, treat the identifiable reason. But when it comes out of the blue, obviously there is something wrong within the brain chemicals. Dr. Muthu Kumar believes an excess of some brain chemicals causes mania while low levels cause depression. I'm aware this is an established explanation. The medications do help right. uh, in bringing these chemical changes, chemical imbalances in the brain back to normal. We kind of equated with people with diabetes, hypertension and things like that. The psychological treatment would help as a kind of an additional support right. For her, that's why I have preferred her for psychological treatment. But I feel that medication management is the mainstay. But if the key to managing Sean's bipolar is balancing her brain chemicals with drugs, 
then it's a real challenge to my growing suspicion that the symptoms each person develops are a result of their life experiences. Till next time, bye. Take care, and you. To investigate further, I'm heading to University College London to meet Dr Joanna Moncrief. A practicing psychiatrist, she prescribes drugs for bipolar patients. Oh, hello. hello. Hi. Hello. hello. But you. after extensive academic research, Dr Moncrief has formed a very different view about how they work and when they're useful. I've been told that bipolar is caused by a chemical imbalance. And I, I wondered what you think of that. This has become a very well-established idea over the last few years. Actually, there really is no evidence that bipolar disorder is caused by a chemical imbalance. There's not even an agreement about what chemical might be involved in bipolar disorder. So if these drugs don't work by correcting a chemical imbalance, how do they work? It's much more likely, in my view, that these drugs are working because they are mind-altering substances in their own right. Most of them are sedating, so they work well in calming someone down, and some of them also dampen down emotions. I've talked to um, some people with bipolar, and I asked one, where would you be now without your drugs? And she says, I would be dead. It may be that people are using sedatives to try and block out their feelings. Right. Um, now, I'm not saying that's wrong. Maybe, that, maybe that's necessary for some people, but mm. I think in the long term, that's probably not a good way to deal with feelings that, that, that you can't tolerate. So that's suggesting that although the drugs might provide some temporary relief, they don't actually cure anything. Yeah. That's a surprise to me. It seems that the drugs used for bipolar can be useful, but this doesn't prove the disorder has an underlying biological basis. In Stratford-upon-Avon, Paul is as manic as when we last met two weeks ago. I will be using this with antimatter photon lasers because what I have is creation at the end of my thoughts. Today, I want to find out whether his delusions of grandeur are in any way related to his former life. Paul's told me that he ran a number of businesses before being diagnosed. Could exploring his past career provide more clues about why Paul's bipolar takes such an extreme form? Kevin Bond is a former CEO of a major utility company who Paul describes as his business advisor. He understands all about the projects, and he also understands me a lot better than many other people do, although not completely. Well, you leave me with Kevin now. I'll leave you and okay. see you in a... OK, see you in a while. See you in a while. How long have you known Paul? About three years now. He made a series of statements to me that, um, instead of just dismissing them, I went and found out um, on Business-related issues, every single issue he's raised, I've checked out, has proven to be correct. Let me first of all just show you a big piece of stone. Okay. That, that piece of marble was extracted from a hill in northern Alabama. That is part of about 1.6 billion cubic feet that is known to exist uh -huh. in that location. And who owns it? Interestingly, a person called Paul Downs. The picture's becoming clearer. I've already noticed that Paul's manias involve powerful feelings of self-belief. Learning that he actually was a multimillionaire, I now want to explore this connection further. Well, this is Philip, but she's come to talk to us. Back at his home, I meet another key figure in Paul's life. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Mama. <laughs> his mother, Irene. Is he your only child? Yes, it took me 11 years to have him. We thought we'd win the pools. He was a treasure. Irene and Stanley, Paul's late father, were determined that Paul would be a success. 
My dad spent a lot of time with him, teaching him to play golf. There you are. He was an amazing golfer. Oh, he was good, yeah? Chosen for England. He was played for England. He was captain in England. Uh, it was lovely because the house was full of big cups. I can see that before bipolar, Paul's entire life was a string of sporting, financial and business triumphs. I won the English Amateur Championship at match play and stroke play. English Amateur stroke play there, English Amateur there, European Amateur Champion as well. That one, that one is here. What's it like to come second? Absolutely horrible. For me, second to the last, there's no difference. If, if you're second or if, if, if you're last, what does that mean uh, to someone as a person? When, when I was playing golf, it would tear me up for... I could finish second in the tournament and it would take me three days of depression to get over finishing second. And I would be practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week. And if you didn't win all the cups, mm. and if you weren't the best intellect in the world, yes. then what would you be? I, I wouldn't want to live. I wouldn't want to exist. You wouldn't want to li exist unless you were the best? Absolutely not. If coming second is worse than death, I'm beginning to see how unconsciously your mind might go to extremes to shield you from that fate. Could the purpose of Paul's belief that he's God be to protect him from the pain of not always being the best? I don't mean that's a conscious decision for the mania takes over. I think it's a sort of survival mechanism. But what happens when those feelings of being all-powerful disappear? Yeah, so long, to understand more, I want to meet Paul once his delusions have subsided. Sean has come to believe that her extreme moods have a simple explanation. She was born with bipolar genes. Hello. Hiya. <coughs> Today, we've come to Cardiff University to explore this biological theory. Here, a pioneering project has analysed the DNA of over 6,000 people. What are you hoping to learn about your genes? <sighs> that they're not crazy. That's all I want. I really worry that one of the boys is going to end up with bipolar and that I've passed it on to my children. I would, I'd be devastated. Mm. My hunch has been that Shan's ideas about her genes are too simplistic. I'm hoping that leading bipolar expert, Professor Ian Jones, can put them in some scientific context. Are uh, the boys' chances of developing bipolar increased because I have bipolar? It's not a genetic condition as if there is a gene yeah. for bipolar disorder. What we know is that there are many probably many hundreds, even thousands of different genes mm -hmm. that are involved in increasing or decreasing the risk. If one parent has bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. we know that their children have about a one in ten risk of suffering with the oh, illness. Right. But on the other hand, they're at a nine out of ten yeah. chance of not having yes, bipolar yeah. disorder oh, over their lifetime. So the good news is, is actually still the chances are you know, children won't have bipolar illness. That's a lot better than I thought, actually. Good. Yeah, mm. good. That's, that's quite comforting to know. Good. It's good news for Sean, but it does make me wonder how certain we can be about the exact role of genes in the disorder. How can we pull apart environmental factors and genetic factors? I think that's the real challenge going forward because environmental factors are also really key. Because environmental factors are passed on. Okay. You know, we, we learn how to self-regulate by yeah. how our, yeah. our parents self-regulate. So um, we'll, we'll learn their patterns of being and behaving. The evidence that we have from countless studies yeah. in family, twin, adoption studies, yeah. and the fact that the genetic studies now that we're doing are coming up with, with very strong and well-replicated evidence of oh. particular genetic yeah. factors that influence vulnerability to bipolar disorder suggests that yeah. the hypothesis that it could be 100% environmental, yeah. you'd have to reject, actually. So that's uh, a no, then? It's a no. <laughs> it's a very long, very complex no. <laughs> 
Today, I've had to revise my views. It seems that some genetic combinations may make you more sensitive to the knocks you experience in life. I very reluctantly have to take on board the fact that genes may well have a determining factor into whether somebody develops bipolar or not. But Sean has a much greater and more personal challenge. She has to accept that her genes are not the whole story. What's happened to her and how she's adapted may also be crucial. If the reasons for Sean's bipolar are more complex than she imagined, what other factors could be affecting Ashley? Meeting his dad, John, and mum, Alison, gives me the chance to find out more about Ashley's life history. What normally happens is with these spells that he suddenly flashes out to them. Very, very suddenly. And that's been the case with them from the beginning. How long has he had them? About um, 12. No, no, that was about 12 or 13. From 12, yeah. What was he like as a baby? Uh, yeah, he was a lovely baby um, in the first year. Uh, after that, he started kind of missing the milestones. He found it difficult to interact with other toddlers. I learned that from an early age, Ashley showed signs of autistic spectrum disorder a developmental disability which can cause difficulties understanding others and being understood. Are you feeling a bit better? Gone away? Yeah. I'm it's just learning away. about you as a baby. <laughs> Don't talk about that. <laughs> oh, you were a lovely baby, Ashley. You're a beautiful baby. Oh. <laughs> When you were at school, Ashley, did anyone sort of know what it was like for you? Did anybody understand? No. Unfortunately, he was bullied a lot at school. I don't think he... He didn't always tell us about all of it. But, I mean, really quite badly bullied, it kind of injured and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. And then we got to the stage where he was escaping from school. Yeah, it was a very hard time, actually. I, actually, I think that you've uh, he kind of bottled up all the the upset and the frustration, and you've got more kind of unhappy as the years have gone by, and you feel like your your life's in danger, don't you? You you've told me that. I'm honest with you, it just begins the um, the thoughts even now. You know, that goes too much. Much of Ashley's condition remains a mystery to me, but it's becoming clearer that difficult life experiences could be playing a part. Perhaps in each depressive spell, he's reliving aspects of his trauma over and over again. Thanks. Here we go. Before her meeting with Professor Jones, Sean believed that her bipolar was set at birth. Since then, she's been reflecting on her past. The way I'm thinking about it now is that there was this little girl that was lost yeah. that nobody really understood. To help Sean explore how her past might be contributing to her symptoms, she's decided to take a big step, trying psychotherapy for the first time. It seems to me nobody could interpret your story of how you felt in a way that made sense to you. Mm. So there remained some dots that weren't joined yeah, up. It and they've like fragmented, you know? Fragmented, and they're yeah. still not joined up. No. I've got to sort of take a bit of a leap of faith, I think, to be able to sort of really be open to change. And that terrifies me. With her psychotherapist, she'll be looking for new ways to make sense of her life and manage her feelings. OK, look, good luck, and I'll see you when you come out, and okay. I hope it goes well. <sighs> OK? OK, thank you. OK. Hello, hiya. Hiya, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to just go in there? 
of Lionel Skew. Today will be about seeing whether they can work together, seeing whether they can form a bond. It depends so much on your relationship with your therapist. I mean, she's got so much riding on it. I hope it works for her. How'd it go? Oh. <laughs> she was great. Oh, that's really, great. really great. I'm having a moment. This is the start of it now. This is the start of the end of it. Do you think this is going to be transformative? Mm. Yeah, thank you. We've been a long time coming. You know, the trouble with the um, I've got bipolar, it's a disease, or I've got bipolar, it's genetic, it closes down the whole exploration of what might be happening or what happened. I think she's beginning to see that she has got a choice, however difficult it is. I hope she gets her emotions to work for her rather than her being the slave to her emotion. In Buckinghamshire, Ashley has also recently experimented with a new type of therapy. But it wasn't a new experience for him. It was the seventh therapist he's tried. Oh, it was not very good. I wasn't any. Really... I felt like he wasn't really on my wavelength um, and uh, found it very difficult to actually uh, talk to him so he understands what I'm saying. There are challenges to doing therapy with people like Ashley who are on the autistic spectrum. I fear this may be why he's had so little success. You do so much to try and help yourself. I don't know anybody who works harder at working out what it is you need and asking for it. Yeah, thank you. I'm hoping other developments in Ashley's life might prove more positive. Hello there. Hi, Hi Mike. Right. Pleased to see you again, mate. How's it going, Rupert, dude? All right, fella. Shoes off? Yes, please. Two weeks ago, he formed a <laughs> band. Be lead tune like down, then. And loop on drums. Yeah, what, like um, a, a loop? Yeah. That's a good idea, yes. I have been concerned about Ashley's isolation and the effect it yeah. might have on him. Wicked. That sounds awesome, man. Thanks, mate. Right, so today fine. marks something of a watershed. Two, four, one, two, three, four, one. I can't change it, though. That's the only thing unless someone else plays it. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Looks, I'm sorry, this is what I this is what's gonna happen, isn't it? I knew it would. Bleeding wood as well. I just. God. Sorry, Philip. I really am sorry. I, I cannot apologise more. I can't. I can't. I just don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. Over the next ten minutes, Ashley fights to stop his negative thoughts spiralling into a paralysing depressive spell. He succeeds. The fact that neither drugs nor therapies have solved Ashley's problems brings home that there are no easy answers to bipolar. But it also makes Ashley's resilience all the more remarkable. He tries his hardest to keep himself calm, and a lot of the time he manages it, and he needs to give himself credit for managing it. This is 80, prog rock. 
I mean, what was uplifting about today is that his friends appear to accept him and accept his mood swings and don't seem particularly phased by them, and I think that's a great thing. It might give Ashley some sort of maintenance to help him feel better about the fact that he does have these symptoms. Cool man. Cool man. In the six months since I last saw Paul, he spent the majority of time under section in a psychiatric hospital. He's finally been released and is keen to meet me again. But according to his psychiatrist, he's now experiencing a depression. I'm a little bit nervous about seeing Paul, actually, because last time I did find him rather intimidating at times because he was so full on and uh, he made so many connections all over the place that I couldn't keep up with him. Hi, Paul. Hello, Hi, good to see you You again. too. Come on in. A little bit different this time, I think. Are you? I want to show Paul some of the footage we filmed together in the summer. How did you feel about watching yourself? Well, I was completely off the chart, um, as delusional as you can get. What I felt at the time of recording was it was so hard to try and sort of well, you couldn't ask me any questions no. that, m that made any sense because I was living in my own delusional world and, 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 you, and, you, and you were try trying to ask real-world questions. I think there's a point here. That's where I'd redesign the golf course. That's right. When I last saw you, you were definitely in a mania. Yes. What does that feel like? Does it feel good? Uh, well, it feels absolutely fantastic. Whatever you want to happen will happen and that you can do no wrong and uh, every, everything everything is going to work exactly as you want e even absolutely ludicrous things i think one thing uh, that exacerbated everything is is i had a form of legal high you were um chain smoking yes. these odd cigarettes well they weren't cigarettes virtually nobody has ever been as high as and delusional as i've been you're even the best at that <laughs> I've certainly gone higher than anybody else, I think. But, of course, that means you go lower than anybody else, too. How are you feeling? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm down, I mean, I, uh, but I'm bouncing back a little bit as I'm beginning to get involved in sorting out the business activities. Yeah. What will Paul make of my theory about the possible cause of his manias? You were an only child, so you weren't, like, one of the kids. So you didn't have that way of being average, if you like. And then, because you're a golf champion and then a really very, very successful businessman, you never had any practice at just being another person. Well, that's definitely true, that part. And so if something did go a bit wrong, then you hadn't got the ways and means or the practice of coping with that. So maybe your brain then just switches into the mania so you don't have to face disappointment or... That's, uh, that's a possibility in conjunction with the legal highs that have, that have, that have accelerated that yeah, to, an, of to an incredible degree. A few years ago, they arranged appointments with a, a psychologist. What he said to me and it, it was that he spends virtually all of his time convincing people that uh, it's OK to be average. And, of course, I've always rebelled against that and tried to excel in, in, in what, I, what I've done. Paul is undoubtedly a lot more sane than when I met him earlier. Um, he's not deluded anymore. But I do notice, even in his sanity, he has this all-or-nothing thinking going on. I'm either the best or I'm the worst. Uh, I'm more depressed than anyone else. I'm higher than anyone else. Paul's beginning to see that there are patterns to his way of thinking. If he could work on that, I feel it might help him manage his manias in the future. 
He describes his current depression as being circumstantial because he's at home looking after his mother and he's not achieving anything, he's not got any net worth. And I think that's sad because I think he is valuable. The people I've met all have their highs and lows and obviously suffer great distress. But I'm wondering how useful the bipolar diagnosis is because they're all so different. I feel it might be more helpful to approach everyone as individuals with unique issues. Because although being labelled bipolar may help some people make sense of their moods, it too often marks the end of self-exploration, when in fact it should really be the beginning. <laughs>